Dealing with data. One thing that pretty much every job that's going to get run in Elastic MapReduce has in common is that you're going to need input data that comes from somewhere. So where do you get your data from? There's a couple common ways to pull data in. One is to get it from S3, from the Simple Storage Service, and that's the most common source of data, and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail over the next couple slides. Now there are other Amazon services that you can use as both your data source and also a, a sync where you write data to. For example, SimpleDB or more recently DynamoDB are key value stores. There is the Relational Database Service uh, and Elastic Block Store, which is persistent kind of like SAN storage that you're attaching directly to the slaves that are in your cluster. Uh, if you're doing web crawling, then you're essentially using an external API making HTTP requests to pull data in. So those are all ways uh, of getting data in, or for some of these, like the other services, those are ways of writing data out, um, as well as S3 can be used as a sync. The most common source of data and the most common place where you're going to write results out to is S3. So let's cover some of the basics of S3. All data is stored as, as objects, as files in buckets. So essentially a file is referenced by a path that has both a bucket name as the start of it, a slash, and then the rest of the path to the file. And under the covers, S3 essentially acts also like a key value store where the key is this path, this bucket, and then the, you know, sort of a directory path to a file under it. However, S3 doesn't have any real directories. The path underneath the bucket is essentially just a key. Now, what are some of the attributes of S3 that make it so appealing? Well, one thing is it's incredibly reliable. Like if you if you set it up uh, using standard the standard reliability, uh, so which means a standard amount of redundancy, it's got incredible reliability, uh, and you know it's scalable. I know clients who store petabytes of data in S3, and it's designed to scale in that you can in parallel both write to S3 from lots and lots of servers, and you can read from S3 in parallel from lots of servers. So it makes it very fast to both pull data from S3 into your Hadoop cluster and push it from your Hadoop cluster back up to S3. Now the way that S3 handles access to data is it's all based on HTTP RESTful requests. So if you want to create something, you're doing a put or a post. Uh, if you're reading data, you're doing a get, and if you're deleting data, you're doing a delete. And there's a Java API as well as a bunch of tools. They all interact with S3 using the same API. Now, some of these tools uh, that you will find out about later in this class are command line tools. For example, there's S3 command, and in fact, there's two versions of it, one in Python, one in Ruby, both with the same name, which is great. Uh, a more common way to interact with S3, at least when you're getting started, is with your web browser. There are two common ways to interact with S3 using a web browser. One is a standard browser interface via the AWS Management Console. And the other is a Firefox plugin. It's a tool called S3 Fox Organizer. Now, both have their strengths and weaknesses, so I often use both when working with S3. So we're going to take a break, and we're actually going to try out these two solutions with S3. We're going to use the AWS Management Console to explore our S3 buckets. Over on the left, we have the list of all the buckets that we own for this account that we logged in with. We can create a bucket. And just to demonstrate that I wasn't lying when I said bucket names need to be unique, I'm going to try and create a bucket with a name called test. <clears throat> and not surprisingly, it complains. Now, if I did something like test KK, that actually is an OK bucket name. From over on the right hand side, you can see I don't have anything in this bucket currently. So I can go up here and click on create folder and create a folder, for example, called test. Once again, I'm going to emphasize that folders aren't real. All you can have inside buckets are objects, which are files that have paths. Different user interfaces simulate folders by creating empty files that then serve as placeholders for directories. So that's what's happening here. When I created the folder, Amazon created an empty file with the name test slash, and that then lets it know that it should show me here a directory called test. Now, if I drill into that directory, you can see there's nothing here. So now we can upload something. Click on the upload button, 
can click on Add File. I can pick a small text file here. I can do the upload, which almost immediately is going to succeed. And so now you can see here I've got the file test.txt sitting here in the test directory of my test kk bucket. If I don't want that file, I can select it and say delete, confirm that I want to delete the file, and the file will be deleted. So in this interface here, it gives you a pretty easy way to see all of your buckets, browse them, create directories, upload files, delete files. Here you see the user interface presented by S3 Fox Organizer, which is a plugin or tool for Firefox. One of the reasons why I sometimes like using S3 Fox Organizer is that it lets me switch between a bunch of different accounts uh, very quickly. The other reason that I often uh, wind up using it is that it lets me very easily work with folders on either side here, where on the left side it's files on my local disk, versus on the right side it's files in S3. So for example, I can go here and say this data folder, I want to download it, and what happens is it'll fire up multiple downloads, one for each file that it finds there, and now they're sitting there on my local disk, and I can also do things like delete these same folders off there, all within the same interface. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the specific aspects of S3. For example, S3 buckets. So this name of, of the bucket, it has to be unique across all users, not just your account. So if you try and create a bucket name, uh, a bucket called test, it's going to fail because somebody somewhere has a bucket with that same name. Now another thing that's an important point is that the bucket name should be DNS compliant, which means the bucket name should be a valid host name. And there's a couple reasons why. One of them, which we'll talk about in a bit, is that Hadoop isn't going to work with paths into to files in S3 if the bucket name isn't a valid host name, because Hadoop's going to try and create a URI using that bucket name as the host name. And the second thing is, if you ever want to make a bucket usable or accessible via a standard browser interface, you can do that, but the bucket name has to be DNS compliant. Second thing is, uh, initially you're limited to 100 buckets per account, um, and you, buckets are always top level. You can't nest buckets, you can't have buckets inside of buckets. However, um, inside of a given bucket, there's really almost no limit to the number of files. I mean, every file, when you create the file, has some costs associated with it. So typically, you don't store millions and millions of little files in S3. But that is a pricing issue that we'll talk about. It's not a limitation of the architecture of S3. And the total amount of data that you're storing in S3 essentially is unlimited, up to many petabytes. Now, each file that's in an S3 bucket has, as we talked about, a path that uniquely identifies the file inside that bucket. So assuming you have the bucket and you have the path, you've got a unique reference to the file. Files are typically written and then read or deleted. So you can't do sort of random access into the file to write to a file to modify it. There's a maximum limit to the size of a file, which is huge. It's like five terabytes. A more common uh, restriction or problem that you'll run into is that every put or post request has a five gigabyte limit, though now S3 supports multi-part uploads, which means you can create this five terabyte file by doing multiple, like a thousand uploads of up to five gigabytes each. Another common gotcha is how different tools require you to specify the path. So for example, if you're using the AWS Management Console to define a job flow, it's going to ask you for the path to your job jar. And when it asks for that path, it's just pure bucket slash path to the jar. But later on in that same AWS Management Console, when you're saying, here's where I want my log files to go, now you have to do S3N colon slash slash and then the bucket and the path. And that's because here what's happening is it's, it's creating a Hadoop path. So it's providing Hadoop with a path. And Hadoop paths typically are S3N protocol, S3 native protocol. 
And then finally, if you're using some of the command line tools, those expect that you're going to provide the path as S3 colon slash slash and bucket and path. Let's talk about how much you pay to use S3. Now the pricing varies by region, so the numbers I'm using below are just for the standard US uh, region. The first thing is data coming in is currently free, which means it doesn't matter where the data is coming from. If you're writing that data into S3, you're not getting charged by the amount of data that's moving into S3. Data out is also free as long as it's going from S3 to servers in EC2 that are in the same region as where the data lives in S3. Otherwise, if data is going from S3 out to either different regions in Amazon or it's going to completely outside of Amazon's cloud, then you get charged per gigabyte. And that rate drops as you send more and more data per month. Separate from the cost per the amount of data that you're moving out is a per request charge. And the fee or the amount you pay per, say, 1,000 put post requests or 10,000 get requests varies. Right. Get requests are cheap. It's only one cent per 10,000 of them. Put and post requests, it's one cent per 1,000 of those. Delete requests are free. And finally, there's the cost of actually storing the data. So we've talked about data, getting data in or out. We've talked about the per request. And now, how much do you pay to actually have data sitting there in S3? They calculate it on a per gigabyte month basis. So for example, if you had 50 gigabytes in there for half a month, you'd be charged for 25 gigabyte months. And the price for that is 14 cents per gigabyte month. And again, it drops as the amount of data you have stored increases. So S3, similar to the file system that's on your laptop, gives you control over who can do what to the things in the file system. And this is handled via access control list. And it's a little bit confusing. So we're going to go over this in some detail. The first thing to understand is that there are two different types of access controls that S3 enforces. One is on the bucket level, and the other is on the object or file level. So at the bucket level, you've got read and write access. Read means I can get a list of everything that's inside this bucket. So I can list all the files that are in the bucket. And write means I can create and update and delete files found in that bucket. Now at the file level, I've got read permission, which means can I read the file, but I don't actually have permissions around write or delete because those are controlled by the bucket. Right? If I have write permission on the bucket, that means I can create a file in that bucket and I can write to it. And then on both files and buckets, you have this access control permissions, which means you have separate control over whether I can see the permissions for the bucket or the file and whether I can modify, I can change the permissions for the bucket or the file. And sometimes in the user interface, you'll see something called full control, which means basically it's, I have all the permissions for the thing, right? I have read and write uh, on the bucket, as well as the con access control read and write on the bucket. And that would be full control. These ACLs, um, access control lists uh, for each bucket and each file can be set a number of different ways. So for example, I can say for given user, you have these rights for this bucket. And when an access control list grant is given to an individual user, it's based on their canonical user ID. So remember at the very beginning when we were setting up the, you know, an account and talking about it, there's this really long string of characters, which is called canonical user ID. And some tools let you essentially find the canonical user ID by entering the user's email address that they registered with uh, when they set up their AWS account. But essentially, it's always based on the canonical user ID. And then secondly, there are some predefined groups. And you can grant ACLs based on group membership. So one of the groups is authenticated users, which means basically anybody who's logged in to AWS. And then there's another group, which is anybody, right? Any user with or without authentication. This is great, though, you do need to be a little bit careful because obviously if you give all users right uh, access to your bucket, that means any user anywhere can create files in your bucket and write data to them and you're going to wind up paying for that. So that's typically something you don't want to do. All right, let's go take a look at 
some examples of viewing and setting these different access controls uh, using the AWS Management Console. Now, what are some of the problems that you can run into with uh, S3 access control lists? One of the common problems that people encounter is that permissions that you set on a bucket don't propagate to things created inside the bucket. So for example, let's say I grant you write access to my bucket, which means now you have the ability to create files inside of my bucket. Great. Well, those files that you create by default are going to be owned by you. You're going to have full control over them. I'm going to have no rights over those files, which means that I'll be able to see the files because I have write access for my bucket and read access for my bucket. So I can list them. I could delete those files, but I can't actually read them. I won't be able to read them until you grant me read permissions on the file. So as soon as you have two different users working with the same bucket, you can run into a number of very odd problems. I own the bucket so I can see the things in the bucket and I can delete them. You've created an object in the bucket. You can't list the objects in the bucket because you don't have read access on the bucket, but you can read the object. Now inside of a Hadoop job, S3 looks just like another file system. Typically the, the file protocol is S3N, which stands for native. There is an S3 protocol, which you don't want to use. As I mentioned previously, the bucket name must be a valid host name. It doesn't mean that it actually has to be a registered host name. It just has to be something that if I take that bucket slash path and I try and create a URI out of it, the Java URI code isn't going to complain because of the host name, which means the bucket name containing invalid characters. So for example, a common one is somebody creates a bucket name that has underscores in it. Underscore cannot be used in a host name. So that will fail. And it's really painful when you've created a bucket and you've uploaded terabytes of data to the bucket, and then you go to process the data in the bucket and you can't because the bucket name has underscores in it. Now, because it's just a regular file system, it means you can use the distributed copy DCP uh, command in Hadoop, and you can specify S3 paths as sources or destinations. And so this is a really common way to, if you have to move data between like two different buckets in S3, often I'll just fire up a Hadoop cluster and then do disk copy to move it. Um, or if for some reason I want to pull data from S3 into Hadoop because I'm going to be doing things with it over and over again, I don't want to keep loading it from S3, then I'll use the diskcp command to copy it into HDFS. Something that's nice is Amazon has added to the S3 support that's already in Hadoop. For example, if you're writing out files that are bigger than five gigabytes, it can just work without any changes or extra effort on your part because they support multi-part upload for files that are bigger than five gigabytes. And they've also recently released their own specific version of the disk CP tool called S3 disk CP, which adds some additional functionality that's useful, things like file patterns. So if you only want to copy files that end in .zip, you can do that. You can specify that the output, the final result of the copy should be compressed. You can essentially um, combine files in different ways uh, by specifying grouping. So you can do other things just out of the box with the command where normally you would have had to have written a custom Hadoop job.